What would happen if you brought two polymer clay experts together and tried to stump them with your hardest questions? You're just about to find out. Now, Blue Bottle Insiders, it's my private learning community. Each month, we bring a different expert to have a convo, an interview. And each of those experts brings something different that I think is going to be valuable to the polymer clay community. This month, that expert is Cindy Leitz. And you know Cindy as your polymer clay tutor. A couple of years ago, Cindy and I did an interview, and you can already read that. You can read that interview on my website. So I thought it might be fun to do something just a little bit different this time around. Now, Cindy and I have talked many times about the competition that we see in the polymer clay community between teachers and artists. You get the whole copying thing, you get the fighting thing, and all of that just stifles, stifles creativity. And Cindy and I wanted to show that two teachers who have a very similar style, who have a very similar audience, have a very similar business, can work together and are colleagues just the same way that two jazz artists aren't in competition with each other, even though they both do the same thing. So we wanted to show how working as a team brings a much better environment that works better for everyone. So we decided to do a special Stump the Experts uh, session. We asked the Blue Bottle Insiders members to come up with their hardest questions. And our volunteer team collected those questions. And that's what this video is about. You're going to see us get stumped as we try to figure out the answers to these really hard questions. And the ones that we couldn't answer, the funny thing is, they're already working together inside of insiders in the community. They're already working together trying to figure out the answer to those questions. And I love it. I love what happens when we learn together. Anyway, here's the video of our Stump the Experts session. Enjoy. Welcome, everybody, to Stump the Experts. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Okay, we are going to try something new. Um, you guys all know me, and you know Cindy Leitz, your Palmer Clay tutor. Hey, hey, hey. hey. how's welcome, it going? Welcome. <laughs> and what we're going to do is our wonderful volunteer team, um, Jennifer Summers, um, Bobby Kelston, is it Kelston? Um, Kirsty Matthews, and Gillian Wiseman. Um, Gillian's not here today, but the others are here. They got together behind the scenes and did a little bit of magic and collected questions because the idea is they're going to hit us with questions and we'll see if Cindy and I can answer them or if we can't. We'll have to figure that out <laughs> between the two of us. And if we, the, if we, we figure if we don't know the answers, not a problem because we'll spend some time figuring them out between ourselves over the next couple of weeks in um, Insiders. And because Cindy and I could not collect the questions because otherwise then we'd know what they were, um, we had uh, the volunteers do it. And because somebody needs to ask us the questions, uh, the lovely master of questions, <laughs> not mistress of questions, master of questions, Jennifer Summers is here to um, guide us. So, <laughs> all right, Um, over to uh, you, Jennifer. Okay, right then, well, crack straight on. Um, how do you achieve an even matte finish on black clay that won't scratch? <laughs> well, nice easy one to start you off. Well, that's a great one. Go for it, Cindy. <laughs> well, like... Like scratching, like we won't scratch if you drag it behind a car or like if you just wear it like normally. Maybe you can do that. Nail scratches. Nail and, scratches. Uh, well, yeah. I, I don't know. You'd have to protect it, I would think, because every brand is different how easily it scratches and how much it shows. Um, you'd have to test that out. Um, I don't know, Ginger, what do you think? Like... Uh, I was going to say what she said. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's just a, like each brand, like, 
some are kind of grayer on the underside, depending on how dark they are, how well they're baked, you know, what you're doing to them. I think if you wanted it to be matte and you didn't want it to show any scratches, I'd probably put a matte finish on it. And but then isn't that, that would, gonna, isn't that gonna look kind of, um, be really hard to get a smooth finish on that? Um, brush, brush yeah, yeah. I suppose maybe if you textured it, uh -huh. with a fine texture on it, then that would probably be your, Yes, bet. These guys are answering it in the chat. Did you see this? this are they? Good. I can't see this the chat at better all. Than, they're better than we are. Um, uh, texture. <laughs> texture yeah, they're talking yeah. about texture. That would work perfect. Yeah. I'm um, going to agree with that. Yeah. Sometimes when I do a matte finish, I'll rub some cornstarch into the surface a bit, and mm -hmm. it gives it kind of a, a frosty kind of look. Mm -hmm. but yeah. If you just want a straight, flat, black finish, I, what clay would you pick, Ginger, as far as showing not the leaf chemo. on scratch? Um, certainly not Papa's clay. Um, it scratches, it, you know, it turns white. Not, um, I'm just thinking the ones that would be difficult. I think. I haven't had much of an issue with, with Primo or Cosplay. Mm -hmm. like yeah. I, and Serenit, like, like all my Serenit pieces, I don't. I haven't had much of an issue with it getting all scratched up. Um, yeah, so. and I haven't had trouble with, with DOS either. And if you want to prevent scratches, um, I would think that the harder the clay, the better. So probably go with Kato. Yeah, I sure and, don't like Kato. And Kato's black isn't necessarily as black, um, but I wouldn't discern it, I don't think. Yeah, and I, well, I, yeah. I haven't had any issues with the Cernet. Yeah, it's also uh -huh. not very black. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. So yeah, I would do I would do Cato and um I would do what um we often what I call a yeah, Cato's not really matte, exactly. And what I would do is what I call a neutral finish. So like hit it with a piece of parchment paper, like use use paper as a texture sheet so that it's just as flat as can be. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just, and you know, so it has a fine texture, but not really a texture. And definitely, when you bake it, you're gonna want to make sure you're not baking it on anything shiny. Mm -hmm. I like to bake on a pizza stone because it's already matte and it's perfectly even, and it's you don't have to put the paper down, mm -hmm. and it's it's a beautiful matte finish on the back. Ooh, black powder, Jenny just mentioned a good one, a good idea. That's that's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't thought of doing that. Yeah. Kirstie's got her hand up and I'm curious why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I remember for your 100 days that you did last year, you did that beautiful black, um, uh, pin, almost a pinch pot, didn't you, Ginger? <laughs> okay, you're going to find the other solution and it's called Photoshop. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh yeah. Ginger. Yeah, okay. oh. bad, 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 bad. No, it's not. It has a nice matte finish, but the thing is, if you hit it, and it's primo, if you hit it with your, um, you know, like fingernails or something, you're going to have a slight amount of, I wouldn't exactly call it scratching, but yeah, kind of. So yeah. So to, would you say that's, you know. Souffle gives a nice matte finish. Mm -hmm. Souffle yeah, does yeah, give yeah, a nice yeah, matte yeah. finish. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> what do you think? No, because some people have got hands up. So should we set some rules here? Because yeah, I'm let's we, sure. we can end up turning this into a debate. So let's if you do have suggestions, put them in chat and that way we can see them. Because <laughs> otherwise we'll be here all day discussing what yeah, I'm thinking we've got a lot of questions here and um... yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm with the okay. next one. I didn't Next. see the, the chat. I didn't have it open, so sorry about that. I had no idea. <laughs> okay. Do you do you see it now? I, have it, I see it now. Okay. Cool. Great. All right. The next question. Need to sh share the screen with you. Just bear with me a minute. There it is. So, I built this mouse house. It's from Gillian. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sagged while baking. How could I support it after multiple bakes? Anybody know why it sagged? It's here, I think, sagging. Did it sag on the first bank? Or the, like, it why are you saying it happened? First, it sagged after multiple. So she said the more she baked it, the, it was slowly sagging down. 
Weird. Uh, and she did it. try to put a further support on it. Um, and it just didn't work. What brand is it? Do you know? Oh, I don't know. I don't she know. She's Kato. Kato. Yeah. I don't work with Kato. It's too smelly for me. <laughs> so I don't. I don't. Smell. What's that? Yeah, I, she she like she doesn't mind the smell. Um, I'm wondering if there was an armature in it because the whole point of an armature is to keep the whole thing from collapsing. It's like a skeleton there, for your body. So there that's was not an armature. She uh, used an oatmeal box. Oh, okay. That's I think I know. Happening. I think that the cardboard got soft and the oils went into the cardboard and then it started slumping. So it didn't have any support. support. Mm -hmm. So probably the first bake, it was fine, but then as, or it seemed fine, but the oils probably went directly into the cardboard when it got hot. That's my mm -hmm. guess. And, and then, then every time, yeah, every time you um, heat the clay, it becomes fragile again and causes it to a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, that's my thought. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if cosplay would do that. I don't think it would be a problem actually, because cosplay has a really high green strength, and it doesn't, it doesn't slump as much. It, it does all its slumping when it's raw and sitting there. If you don't go ahead and bake it, but once you like, when you go to bake it, 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 it doesn't slump like that. Um, I'm thinking you would have less issues, but I also probably wouldn't bake directly ever bake directly on a um, paper product oh i would wouldn't bother me at all to do that you wouldn't but i would no, yeah, yeah. kind of steal it or something i wouldn't mind baking on the paper but i wouldn't want well yeah i would probably i would probably not so much to seal it but allow the clay to stick to it better i would probably hit it with glue first and let it dry yeah, but, I'm just thinking like as an armature, I don't think I would use paper. I would use something, armature. right. I wouldn't use yeah. paper as an armature. I would use something stiff as an armature. Yeah, yeah. baking on is, is fine usually, like as a support or something. But yeah, I've, I'll wrap things in um, in like masking tape or washi tape or something else or seal it. That is actually the next part of the question because that came up as well. Do I need to seal a paper clay form before curing clay? What do you think, Cindy? I don't, not if, if you're just using it as a form to take away, but it, as in that example, they're leaving it on the inside. Yeah, I don't know. I It looks like it could be a problem. I haven't done a lot of, I've done some paper mache, but paper mache also has like a bunch of glues and stuff in it, right? So that's already sealed. Mm. It's not absorbing. Mm -hmm. I haven't well, baked directly on a cardboard box or anything like that and left the box in. I have, and it doesn't stay very well. It's really hard to construct it because you try to put the clay to it and it sticks more to your fingers than it does to the cardboard and you just can't get it built in the first place. So um, what I would do would be to, um, I would coat it in, um, the simplest thing to do is coat it in white glue and let it dry. And yeah. then, then, you, then it's shiny and stick, so you can stick the clay, clay to it more easily. And then that solves the problem of subsequent problems. So I've done like little boxes, you know, made little boxes like that. Also, I'm thinking it's possible, depending on how humid your area was, your box could be absorbing mm -hmm. um, moisture as well. So you might get it, True. it kind of repelling it, mm -hmm. repelling mm -hmm. it off if it's not sealed in. Because I'm thinking of like I've baked a fair amount of times on on wood forms, but I've always um, I've always like dried them out in the oven first just to be sure there wasn't any moisture mm -hmm. or anything in the wood, and then depending on if it had a primer on, like if you buy those little cutout letters and stuff like that, some of them already have primers on them. Mm -hmm. Some of them are made with MDF, which is basically got glue in it to hold all those fibers together and all that. So I don't seal those. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, you can run into some issues with mm -hmm. something that's absorbent like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to agree with that. Good. <laughs> say that all the time. You can't. Not, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Try harder. <laughs> okay. Okay. So on a making's extruder, when replacing the O-ring, how do you get it to stay in place 
and stop it squeaking. <laughs> Are you going to answer first, G Ginger? Ooh. Yeah, let's Ginger, you off first this time. Okay. Oh, well, we'll take turns. I guess that makes more sense. Yeah, That's yeah. logical. Um, okay. Um, ah, well, it should stay in place just fine if it's the right size. Number one, I would think. Um, and as far as not squeaking is concerned, most of the time it's not squeaking because of the O-ring, it's squeaking because of metal to metal. And in either case, I would think actually the best solution is to use some silicone grease, um, not Vaseline, but silicone grease. And um, silicone grease to lube the oil ring, o ring and to lube the, the screw thingy, the screw rod. And that would be the same for, um, the Macon's or the Walnut Hollow or the female or the, the texture, I would yeah. think. That's my thoughts, so. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, um, there's, yeah, you need some lubrication in there. Otherwise the rubber's grabbing on the, the metal. And if it's if it's popping off of there and it's the O-ring that was supposed to come with your set, then it means that it's dry against metal. Like it's just grabbing somehow. Maybe it's possible to that your extruder is grubby on the inside. You could kind of wipe it out with, uh, I often have used like a baby wipe on the end of my little brush and run it through and uh, clean the inside out. Um, and then, then you want to have a lubrication on those O-rings for sure. I happen to have a little pot of the grease. Now, I didn't know about the difference, but I saw you, you were talking about it, Ginger, mm -hmm. about Vaseline versus silicone mm -hmm. grease. And I've been always using the silicone because that's what I had. Mm -hmm. Lucy had sent it, or like Lucy Glenn. Well, the Lucy has, it's actually a lithium soap is what they have, which is different than silicone grease, but like splitting oh, hairs. It's, well, I looked, no. li yeah, li it's called <laughs> lithium soap. I, I looked it up and um, it's, it's slightly different, but generally the same thing. It's the same basic concept. Um, and to answer a question I saw pop up before to get silicon grease, you can get it at the hardware store because it is exactly what's used to lube the O-rings in faucets. Um, if, because, you, because, and so you can get it in hardware stores. You can also get it in dive shops, same concept. Um, but um, yeah, go ahead. What would you feel about putting something like WD-40 on there? Would that be okay? It's silicone based, isn't it? I'm pretty sure, you know what, or I'm pretty, no, actually I think, no, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, because be yeah, also, the label. I'm also mm -hmm. thinking of Ar Armorall is si silicone based, isn't it? Armorall but then would it, probably work, yeah. It might work, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. And the reason why Vaseline doesn't work, um, Oh, yeah, it breaks down the rubber. Breaks part. down the rubber. We learned yeah. that in sex ed. Oh. <laughs> so, you won't go there. Yeah, we yeah, didn't we have any it. sex ed up here in Canada when I grew up. You know, we had to figure out that you stuff. Yeah, to figure that stuff. <laughs> yeah. well, anyway, no Vaseline. So, okay, next question. <laughs> you sure you want to move on? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. I'm ready to share a screen again for this okay. one. I really hope this is the right image. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, how did Catherine Neumeyer make her clay so clear with the green lines in it? This uh, one's over to Cindy. Um, I think it looks like she used a, like had a log of translucent clay or something with um, something on the outside, like a powder or alcohol ink or something on the outside, and then twisted it around it. That's what my guess is. That's why it's kind of on the outside and kind of showing towards the inside a bit. So like, as she, and then I'm thinking she probably hit it with a heat gun to get it clear. So once you bake your translucent, it's going to be reasonably clear. And it looks like also it might be um sarinet probably it looks clear but i don't i'm not 100 percent sure i haven't seen what she does but that would be my guess it looks a little like that technique that ginger does but i'm not really sure how ginger does it because i don't have her tutorial <laughs> <laughs> but that would be my guess right like the because it seems like the color is on the lines is getting dragged towards the inside a little bit or and, and you can kind of see it on the edges so I feel like it was a, like on a, 
in layers or in between or on something and it was wrapped around or twisted maybe on the outs maybe on one side and twisted or or something like that and then sanded and hit with a heat gun and all that kind of stuff that would be where i would start if i was mm -hmm. trying to reverse engineer those <laughs> but how oh, about I you know. ginger do you know um i don't know um because i've never i have actually tried to do this one and i've never been able to completely um maybe it was a sad experience let's just put it that way for one thing i don't think that this is completely solid clay i think this is partially femo liquid if not all femo liquid so that's one topic i think oh. it's done in a mold um and if it's not done in a, it, it occurs to me it's done in a mold and the spiral it may have been created in you know, like with something twisting inside, you know, tw uh, it's too even twisting. though, like to be like, yeah, yeah. you are trying to go swirly on the inside of the mold with a liquid. Right. But another, another thing you can do is, um, you could create a spiral out of solid clay, like let's say out of translucent and put a coating of pastel on it maybe and then put it in the mold and then fill it with liquid clay but that might get bubbles and i think you would also see an interface line between the spiral and the liquid clay so I'm i don't think I, yeah i don't think it's liquid clay though. yeah no maybe. i think it is i think it is because it i've looked at these before and actually like i said it might be a combination but on these up around the top there's a um there's wire wrapping and if you look at them on um if you look at them on um, Flickr, you can see from a different view, you can see there's a spiral from the wire wrapping and you can see that there's something on the, the wire. So it's like liquid clay over the top of it. Um, Phyllis mentioned that it says that it's um, Pardo. And yeah, it says Pardo in some of the views, but not all. And that's why I'm thinking it might be a combination. So it might be partly solid and then coated with liquid clay. Yeah, that's a possibility. I, I I feel like the twist is made with with solid clay because the it just is too even. And it looks like a snake that got twisted. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. Or agree and that. and then yeah, maybe you're right about maybe there's a liquid clay coating on the outside. I don't know. I it it, it it's I don't know. It's See, it I think we clay. this is what's called we're stumped. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Well, we don't have to try it. Yeah. Yeah. That's unless, awesome. unless, um, I'm oh, sorry. Do you want it back on? No, you're fine. Uh, unless maybe you put it in the mold, let it. No, no, it's yeah. not. It's yeah. Yes. It's just getting weird. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking like hard. you could twist it in the mold, but then yeah, it, no, no. Yeah, this is not going to do it. No, yeah. no. I'm back to solid. And part of sounds, not part of might do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Don't be well, actually, there was one other little thing because I was thinking in the back of my mind. Um, have you ever done Letta Shinio? Um, with um, Carolina took this with me. The um, ribbon, like um, glass canes that have ribbon in them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> it's not as simple. It, it, it's you can make a cane that you then twist to get that spiral. Yeah. And that that can be done. And now I'm wondering if you start with that and then coat it with liquid clay. I think there's something in there. One more quick thing on that. I'm thinking it's possible. The reason why it looks a little bit twisted, like if they did that that um, cane work thing with the like the glass guys do with the twisting, what did you call it? Latticinio. Oh, OK. Still don't know, <laughs> um, but uh, it's, the, it's the twisted glass guy thing. Okay, yeah. so that one. Yeah, I oh, think that it's possible that they did the twist and everything, and then rolled it in their hand a bit because it, it looks a little twisted at the bottom, and also like they could have done that thing where you make it into like a teardrop and and rounded it out a bit at the bottom because it does look a little twisty but it does seem like there's a powder that got drifted to the inside a bit so yeah maybe a twisted ribbon or something like that but anyway okay we can move on <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> why does cracking happen and how do you prevent it <laughs> <laughs> well the 
the way you solve cracking, okay, the cause of cracking is the day of the week, the weather, the temperature, how you're standing, <laughs> what brand of clay you're using. Um, it is, you know, what you had for breakfast. It's, who knows? Um, there are specific things that do cause cracking, like air bubbles, but there sometimes cracking just happens. And um, cracking, uh, one thing that does cause cracking, and I think that if you you guys have might have noticed might have noticed this in the the pinch pot challenge, that if you stretch your clay and then bake it, it will crack when it's baked because there's a clay has a memory. It doesn't like it likes to come back. It it doesn't like being stretched. You can press it, but if you pull it and stretch it, it'll come right back. It, it'll, so I think you can get some cracking in, in that regard. Was that the rest of the question? What was the rest of the question? Was what yeah, causes cracking? It. So it's um, how, what's the cause and how to prevent it? Well, fundamentally the cause of cracking is anytime you have two, two you have expansion and uneven expansion and contraction of different aspects. So if you've got ones, you know, one's expanding and contracting more than the other, that's the problem. So, um, and clay is fragile when it is, oh partially cured and um, yeah it's fine um clay is partially i get distracted easily um <laughs> when clay is cured partially and still hot it's fragile so if you have any kind of uneven pressure on it it'll go crack so you want to avoid that so that's yeah over to you <laughs> yeah i i I find that cracking happens a lot when you have too thick of a piece that hasn't been cured properly. So especially if it's like a full piece that's round or, or it's completely sealed all in. So like a lot of times you see people and they want to make a figurine or a doll head or something and they make the whole thing solid and anything past anything past say a quarter inch, somewhere between a quarter inch, half an inch, anything bigger than that, the outside starts curing because it got hot, right? The, the heat got there, but the inside hasn't got warm enough yet. And so it's just sitting there waiting to get warm. The outside starts to cure a little bit and only some of the particles have cured. So they, they're kind of hard. They're now firm, but they're at that perfect yeah. cracking stage. Mm -hmm. Then there's a little moisture, air bubbles, stuff in the clay that needs to get out and it, it's trapped in there now because you've kind of sealed the outside in this skim of a crusty layer and then it's got to go somewhere it's got to get out somehow and it it cracks the surface so like if i think that you i haven't done a, a formal test on it i think the only way that you could bake something thick like that is to start it really kind of cold mm -hmm. well one idea i had was to put it in a sous vide bag and like yeah it, so that you could get the whole um temperature up right very slow right from the from the right. center all the way up mm -hmm. before it got heated all the way through and then so you could probably do that thing that people used to do years ago that step baking thing where ramp, you ramp put baking. it in at 100 yeah. and then you know, tip, and then bake it for a while and you're just slowly warming it up from the center out mm -hmm. then you could probably bake a, a thicker piece without cracking it Mm -hmm. But air bubbles, moisture too. I think in some of the areas um, that have high humidity and that kind of thing, you get a little bit of water in there, sweaty hands, I don't know, something that didn't dry, paint in there, something trapped, and then you got your outside crusty mm -hmm. thing happening, and then you got to gas off that mm -hmm. steam, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to agree with that very much so. Um, I think this is also, um, it, this ties into the placking as well. Exactly. Agreed. 100% agreed. See, not stumped. Or no. Kind of stumped. <laughs> no, wait, no, no stumped. Oh, and Shelly mentioned that Donna Cato always starts her curing in a cold oven. If starting curing in a cold oven is a fan flippantastic idea if your oven heats evenly. If your oven goes up to 350 and then back down to 250 and then a bad idea. But if your oven is like you turn it on and it just gently goes up to 275 and sits there, which no oven on the planet does, but if yours does, then great. 
So if you have it tented and you have a um, like a pizza stone in there, the pizza stone will kind of yeah. absorb anything that's too hot too fast. Like it kind of tempers everything. But you have to make sure that you have you're not turning on your timer until the whole until the thing whole is thing, up to temperature. Until the item itself is the right temperature. Oh no, this is a baking question. We're saying we're doing baking questions. Now. Yeah, but I guess that's you know it's still stumping people. I get probably a thousand questions a year about stumping. I mean, it's about stumping, about baking. Right, right. <laughs> it's not about stumping. No. Okay, <laughs> no, no. we're going on. Okay, and again, uh, another screen share. Okay. Da -da. No. Uh, this one about Lasher glass. How do I make my own design to resemble the blown, blown glass beads of larger glass? Who wants to go first? It doesn't matter, either one. I think we're both gonna have fairly similar answers, but yeah, go. Well, huh? yeah, for, it, for the round ones, just plain round, that's pretty simple, just a round bead. Um, for the other ones, um, I would make molds. Um, I would start by sculpting. Um, I would make the, the first bead. Um, of course, these are all, the ones shown are all slightly different, but I would start, you could just sculpt it basically, just like these look fairly smooth. So you could um, add like little balls or something and press them in. And it, it'd take a fair bit of sculpting to make the first, you know, to make the first one, but then I would make a mold. To make more so that's one thing but regardless um whether you sculpted them or molded them um you get the little balls you know the little beads and then i would hit them with a nice glossy um mica powder rub it in real good with a brush get it real polished and bake them and then i would antique them with a diluted tan paint of some sort and rub it in and then rub it off that's that's what i do so I think I would, because there's a lot of like um, sculpted buttons and things that have that type of um, the pattern on it mm -hmm. and have that antique finish. I'd probably make like a little mold, two molds so that I could squish it on either side at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I would do something like push a button into a, into a mold, whether I use silicone mold or even Cosclave works fantastically as a mold, by the way, because mm -hmm. it's so flexible probably make a double-sided one that I could squeeze the ball of clay in and, and kind of make it because the edges aren't, they're nice. They're kind of rounded off. They're not really crisp on their, on the patterns there. And then I would use, um, well, I'd probably start off with some sort of tan kind of colored clay or a golden kind of colored. I would use maybe pearlex powders or mica powders in the uh, mold that would be a cool way to kind of get it right in there and release the beads as well and then i would bake it antique it obviously it looks antique and then i would probably hit the high the high spots with one of the metallic pow um creams whether it's like um oh i don't know probably Gilder's paste or something like that get the high spots or use like a glazing powder or a glazing, mm -hmm. a glaze, something like that. But yeah, that, that looks, they look really pretty. Mm -hmm. I like um, the blue ones. Yeah. Yeah. I like them. And I, they're, they're quite simple. They're not going to be a terribly difficult thing to make, but mica powders are your friend in this particular situation. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Thanks. Not stumped. Not stumped. <laughs> Hey, it's don't get now. cocky. Just you wait. <laughs> okay. Okay, next one. Who first saw that clay maintained its shape for the caning process? Who first saw it? Yeah, who first noticed that clay maintained its shape so, so they could use it for a cane? Well, because I mean, the first person to notice that it was the person that made FEMO would notice that it was that it wasn't liquid. I mean, that's what happened when you made, vinyl was originally a plastisol, which was a liquid, and then they made it thicker. So they're the ones that noticed it was thicker because they made it thicker. But as far as the first person to make a cane, I don't know. So was that 
really the question? And maybe well, Sunny knows more than I do. <laughs> who was the first? Who was the first caner? Oh, first caner. Yeah, oh, we'll yeah. we'll we'll Man slightly Rush. reshape the question like you would with the cane. Nan Rush. <laughs> Nan Rush. There. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But Cindy, your thoughts? <laughs> the I don't know. I I think I have no idea. Like uh, Ginger says, it's Nan Rush. I don't know. There could be any, any, it could have been anybody, honestly, because you know, she, she's the first known one, I guess, <laughs> but who knows? Like it, that kind of stuff is pretty tricky because a lot of, a lot of times that kind of thing can be, other people can think of it spontaneously at the same time. A lot of those kind of techniques, when, especially if it comes from another world or another area, mm -hmm. you know, um, I saw recently um, someone in the caking in the cake industry, I do a lot of cake decorating and they were doing caning techniques. And you know that they've been watching some of our, uh, our videos or her videos, who, who somebody's videos in the clay world. And you know that it's just kind of morphing and getting all over the place. So, but um, yeah, Nan Roche, I guess. I didn't okay. know that. I know, I do know that Nan Roche was um, one of the very first ones who was looking at it as an art medium and started doing caning. But you know how that goes. I heard that from Nan. Oh, here we go. Somebody says Nan Nan wrote the book, but Kathleen Amp is the first is the one with the caned images. Yeah, it's like Cindy said. There's a lot of it, it's a lot of forces come together at the same time, so it'd be very difficult to identify. Yeah, I take ideas from the woodworking world, the all these different worlds, and it would it's especially now with the internet, it's just turned into one big soupy mess. So. <laughs> who did something for, like I think that I was the very first person to figure out the um how to make a really cool raku but then other people say oh no I did that first so like it's just a lot of that kind of stuff is um figured out and mm -hmm. all at the same time and somebody figures out something else but caning I mean that's been around what like with the, in the glass world hundreds and hundreds right. of years so it's not much of a stretch to yeah and when you look at that. um you look at glass trade beads. Oh, they're so obviously caned, and it's yeah. so obvious, you know. So that's really old. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty, yeah. Okay, not stumped. <laughs> <laughs> there were several questions about adding things to clay for various reasons. Uh, they included oil paint for color, baby powder to reduce stickiness, and baby oil for softening. Either on or into the clay. Are they safe and effective additives? We have, we, this is a few questions all put together. together gotcha. Yeah. Okay. What, what say you, Cindy? <laughs> well, I mean, I've used baby oil before to soften stuff up to try, like I've tested it out, it, it works. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a ton of anything super organic in. I think that it's kind of better to put, uh, okay, the reason why I don't want to put anything organic, like olive oil in, for example, is you might get some, it going rancid, right? You've got organic materials in there. So something that's non-organic would be better. Um, Cornstarch seems fine. I don't know. I've mixed in um, different spices and things like that. I think you have to sort of test things and see how it goes over time. Some stuff has the chance of getting wet again. Like if you had big chunky pieces of cinnamon bark in there, maybe it gets wet down the road. If it's not sealed, it could get moldy. You know, there's sort of issues with certain things going in. And obviously if you put too much of something in, you're gonna offset the up or upset the balance of what makes the clay all hold together. Um, and also you never know what kind of additives are in the other things. It could cause a reaction. It could cause it to fall apart. It could cause a bunch of different things. So I think I'm of the, the frame of mind that you try everything, but then you don't sell it unless you know that it's got a long, long-term, you know, viability to it. Right. You know, don't start, you know, try something this week and then sell it next week. It's just, you need to play if you're going to play because I think playing is how we come up with the cool stuff absolutely you know so I don't know it 
<laughs> but you can upset the balance. I put in too much powder and had it all fall apart. Right. Um, I mix, you know, chalk pastels into liquid clay, even which you would think would really work. Like you could add a lot. Well, there's mm -hmm. a point where it just sort of starts falling apart. It's like right. adding, you know, water to to rocks. It's it, if you don't right. have enough, you don't have any goop. Yeah, nothing to hold it together. Right. Right. So yeah. But I think, yeah, you have to be a little careful. And especially if you're um, planning on doing, you know, reselling your stuff and being doing big, gorgeous art pieces that go into a museum or something, you're not going to want it to start falling apart, you know, six months, eight months down the road, right? So uh, you're sometimes better off just using the stuff that comes with the, with that. Agreed, the 100%. Itself. I'm, I'm 100% right. She took the words right out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> I will say that liquid clay is the same components as polymer clay. I mean, it's the same stuff. It's just without the stuff that makes it doughy. Um, and then plastic, uh, liquid, I'm um, sorry, clay softener, liquid clay softener, diluent, is just plasticizer. So adding those to the clay is always going to make it stronger. Adding oil to clay is always going to make it weaker. I mean, not if you just add a little bit. It's not like adding a little makes it weaker. You know, a couple drops. Was, yeah. Right, right. No big deal. But ultimately, it dilutes the strength. And it'd be it'd be the same thing as if you're making cookies and you your cookie dough is too dry. We've all been there. And you want to make it a little bit wetter so that your cookies will hold together instead of falling apart. Um, then if you add water, well, it'll hold together, but it won't have a very good consistency after they're baked. It's also, it, it, it dries out and then it goes away. It's not like right. adding butter that has something that's going to Right, work. or eggs or something that would, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Milk even, <laughs> cream. Yeah, milk, yeah, because protein, yeah. Yeah. Did hey, we get I them all? There was a bunch in there. Did we get them all? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh, there was oh also on the same kind of thing. They all work, they actually work fairly good. One I'm gonna make a little bit of a statement on though is I've noticed recently that people are using liquid clay diluent or liquid clay softener. They are using it as a smoothing agent, which it does work, but um it's it's like using a really big hammer for a really little nail. It's using plasticizer and it's not really necessary. Um, if you're gonna smooth your clay, you can do the same thing with baby oil um, or it, it, water. Some people use water. Um, using clay softener, um, why expose yourself to the chemicals? And even though I know we know they're safe, but still why? Um, and it's expensive. So I'd rather see somebody use the liquid or the diluent or clay softener than rubbing alcohol because rubbing alcohol does work if you're kind mm -hmm. of wiping off something, but to smooth it, like, like, like those guys that do the big sculptures and they, mm -hmm. they want to take a little brush and, you know, make sure that every little, it's true. Um, if you use rubbing alcohol, you can actually sort of really dry out the surface. It dries it, yeah. And it then, dries it and crackles it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also you wouldn't want to use water on FEMO or mm -hmm. Serenet because, you know, it's going to sticky, get all sticky. yummy and sticky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, th one thing I did try once and it, it was, it worked pretty well was I had done a little sculpture I, um, for my nephew and I'd sanded it and everything and, and did a really nice job. And then later I saw some little other flaw and I just wanted to sand the one spot and it kind of said, I didn't want to redo everything. Right. I did brush it with some um, uh, clay softener and popped it back into the oven and it completely mm -hmm. smoothed everything mm -hmm. out. So, and it, it took away those white marks from the mm -hmm. sanding. Um, I know I was supposed to be doing all this stuff, but the present was supposed to go in the, in the, right. and I saw a flaw that I wanted to remove. Well, I think this ties in with one of the things that I catch some flack for sometimes when I say, um, stop using um, acetone on your baked clay to get rid of your bubbles. Well, if you are in a bind 
this is an absolutely wonderful tool to know about because it'll get you out of trouble. But as far as it being an everyday practice that you should aspire toward, no. <laughs> Learn yeah. how to make clay without bubbles. So I, I think that to me, that's more like that is that liquid, uh, diluent is, is a big hammer and use it when you need it, <laughs> but don't be using it all the time. There are other ways of doing it there. It's a, that's more clear. Okay. Yeah. And I think um, part, part of the problem that's out there is partly my fault <laughs> because <laughs> you're the uh, one. <laughs> I made like YouTube videos and I'd show them how to use this thing or that thing. And then, uh, um, you know, a ton of people watch it and then they use it as their only tool. Right. And, well, yeah. I happened to watch some of the other videos too, that had the other less, you know, severe options. Like there are 18 different ways to, mm. to uh, soften up clay. Right. And who knows what country you're in or whether you can get the product or, you, you know, with this big shortage, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that, you're doing something at the last minute, but, yeah, it's it's partly my fault. But I see that we missed the oil paint on the baked oh, yes. clay thing. On the baked clay. And also Tom's holding up some goop stuff. I don't oh, know what I that see is. Tom. I can't see Tom. Um, oil paint on baked clay. Yes, absolutely. No problem. As long as we're talking at artist oil paint, um, it works just fine. It just takes forever to dry. Um, and lots of times you can, uh, it, you may not like the finish, but you can do it. Um, oh, I love him, the tooth fairy. Um, but the as far as oil, there are some oil-based hobby paints that get sticky. I do know that. So anyway, um, what were we? Okay. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> so was Tom wanting to share I a? Think trying to share what he was holding up but oh, okay no just hold us up i can we can yeah. um we can highlight you tom yeah you we can highlight, highlight you yeah. oh goop yeah uh, i've heard a lot of people use that yeah on their brushes and stuff um for for doing oh yeah, up yeah on um the cleaning up sculptures and that kind of thing and I think it's um, got an oil base, like an orange oil base, right, Tom? Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like one of those orange oil cleaner type things, and people use that on your brush. And I think you know if you're doing a a big dyna, a, a hand cleaner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. If yeah, if you if you're doing a big sculpture and you're just trying to touch up the all of those little scales on your giant, you know, um, dragon or something, that's what I'm thinking of. They'd want to use like a little paintbrush, a little artist brush, and put a little bit of goop on there or a little bit of softener and stuff. And I think some of it could be like it's, it's a very, very tiny amounts they're using on there because they don't want it all gummy and streaky mm -hmm. and, and all that. Very and fair. it's more because you and I don't do a lot of sculpting, but I've watched a lot of the sculptors and they tend to use brushes and do that mm -hmm. with a softener and stuff. And it works quite well. Okay. Okay. This is going to be quite a big question, I think, and I, I'm not sure you're going to be stumped, but uh, <laughs> would you recommend cosplay for jewellery? The deco line is too soft to use easily. Any tips how to work with it? Maybe you can talk about cosplay in general. So, cosplay, go. Cause Cindy, because you know, I have not worked with it very much, and I know you work with it extensively. Yeah, um, I, I can just, I can, I can talk about how it compares to other brands for like strength and stuff, but I really can't say a whole lot about how it functions. So, yeah. Um, cosplay is this wonderful beast of an, uh, like it's a combination between polymer clay and rubber. So it has a little bit rubbery kind of <laughs> look to the surface. So like, if you're expecting it to look exactly like sarinet it's not going to it looks different and it has kind of a dull rubbery thing to it but i absolutely love it like and i know some people find it sticky and some people, all this kind of stuff but you've just got to figure out it's like all the other clays you've got to figure out the way it works and and what you can do with it and i have a couple of little pieces here on my desk and actually this necklace that monica is wearing um I'll, i can show you that in a second it's got cosplay in it but it's I, I, you can get it paper thin. Like if you're making flower, this is a petal, like a, like a leaf that I've made. 
And look at it. Like you can just bend it in half. You can crumple it up and it just pops back up. There isn't, there isn't a, a other clay that will do that really, in my opinion. I've seen, like you can bake Primo really well, but you know, I still broke it after, even if it's baked well on when, if it's this thin, right? Like, I mean, this thing is just, I love it. I wouldn't use anything else if I'm making um, flowers and stuff. The thing about it is I think that it, it does better if you've added, if you paint it, add glaze, like this has got like a, um, it's got a color wash on it with a glaze that I've used, um, like glazing liquid and mixed colors in and painted. It just has a richer look to it when it has more things to it. Cause it has kind of a flat rubbery kind of look to it. Mm, it does. This little um, pinch pot is made with the cause clay glow and it, it moves nice. It, you can get some beautiful um, finishes on it. This has got a little bit of powder. I've never made a pinch pots before, so it's not, <laughs> I wouldn't say it was a masterpiece, <laughs> but you know, it's fun. It, it, it's neat to work with. It's a little different. It, it, this is cause clay here. I made just a little thing. I've got lots of little cause clay things around. I'll show you the um, necklace. Here's a necklace that I made that looks like a blackberry vine. And like it, you know, you don't have to worry about the little, the, the tiny, tiny little points on these um, thorns breaking off. Anything else I would work with would, that would probably break off, especially with moving it back and forth too much. These are cause clay. The, the berries I made with um, liquid clay and, and um, powder mixed in and made in some molds that I, I molded on real blackberries. So that's why they look quite real. And it, it's super fun. I can, this is on a piece of wire and you can bend it, whatever, you know, it's a weird necklace. You know, you, the only time you're ever gonna wear something like this is probably to some sort of fairy um, cosplay event, you know, but I love it. It's cool. It looks real. It looks like you've wrapped a vine around and it, it's neat. Um, it, the colors, you do have to mix them because they were all basic colors. Uh, but I think it really enhances with, uh, with waxes and flexible paints and things like that. I think it does a beautiful job. I, this one here has got, I've colored it with a, with a pencil crayon, with a Prismacolor pencil crayon. And it just, it, 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 it's neat. I love it. It's, it's one of my favorites, to be honest. And so can you make jewelry? Yes, of course. Um, can you make it look exactly like something else? I don't know. We'll have to see. We're going to be, I, I'll be playing with it some more. So. And the mm. one thing I could say about jewelry is I have found that when you are, when people say jewelry, they often mean earrings. And um, I think they would be challenging to make this cutter style earrings, not so much because they would be unsuitable, they, they would make great earrings, don't get me wrong, but they would be very flexible. And if you are an earring fiddler, you'd spend all your time flexing it. You'd be, you'd be fiddling with it and, and flexing it. And they're very much, cost clay is very much the same consistency as like eraser clay, that really soft. So it's, it's you would, you'd be messing with it. And you might yeah I don't know when it's putting it when it's thicker it's not it, it does bend and stuff but it it's not like it's it's not erase. stiff it's, it's not, not stiff like it's not no 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 I don't mean that no. I just mean that it's not stiff like it's not stiff like Kato would be or Primo would be so it's very flexible so yeah. Yeah. if that's not what you want for what you're doing that might be something yeah uh, yeah I mean I, feel I would have all kinds of yeah yeah I think you should have more than one kind of clay in your if in your bingo studio. very much so very if much you're, so. if you're going to experiment with different things so mm -hmm. um yeah i i think that there's a million different kinds and you should try one block of every kind and see which one that works perfectly for you i, I mean agree. my yeah that's what I have you tried mixing the clays cost cause clay with other clays mm -hmm. yeah I have a video on, on Instagram, on our Polymer Clay Tutor Instagram, where I mixed every brand that I could find in my studio. So I think it's like 22 different brands or something like that. 
50-50 mixes with cosplay and I go through how they turned out. Some of them got a little bit weird. Some, um, some of them got kind of stiff. Some, so, you know, cosplay is a different clay than, it's not 100% polymer it's like rubber too so it's it's a little different you can mix it in um like as a 50 50 mix it it it's fine but it yeah some of the brands i think it was Cato that it acted quite weird with so um you have to test it out and and figure out your mixes but yeah you can mix most clays and and do something but you may have to play with the ratios um a little bit but yeah it's it's fun try it for sure Great. I'm just reading that from May there. She asked cos clay if it contained rubber. It doesn't contain natural latex, no. No. So okay. it's, when they say rubber, they're not meaning rubber. They right. mean rubber. a rubber like, and technically, if you look up the definition of rubber, you could include polymer clay in that. So. <laughs> I know that all of their ingredients are, um, they are all food safe ingredients. Don't oh, eat the clay. Yeah, they all are. So they're, <laughs> I would, and they would be considered vegan, but you don't eat it. So it's not yeah, vegan, yeah. but they, do, they don't use any um, animal products in, in their clay, but they're all, um, they're all non-toxic and they're all like food safe like fine so it's it's he really wanted a clay that would not because you know he's from the industry the movie industry and stuff they make a lot of props and all that kind of stuff and they didn't want something that would be hard hard on the artist to use over time like some resins and stuff are right and where you can get like a toxic reaction right. to it over time and he wanted to make sure it was a like very very safe to use so uh, so not stumped <laughs> Are you ready for this one? How do you put up with all the beginner questions? Well, we were all beginners. So I, I have an enormous amount of patience. I don't Just know. more than I do. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. <laughs> Judging by like our conversations gingered together, I think I do. I think I, as far as much more patience. Side, than much I do. But you're right. Everybody, everybody's a beginner once. Yeah, I think I consider myself a student and a teacher because I'm constantly learning. So I'm still a beginner. I'll, like, I don't haven't done a lot of sculpting. I've seen a lot of stuff done. I kind of know the basics of sculpting. And, um, you know, I would, I'm always a beginner at something. And I don't oh, yeah. have a hard time with, I don't consider anything really stupid questions. I, it, it can get a little bit tiresome, but, you know, to answer the same thing, but it never pisses me off. No, it, no, I never, the only thing that ever, well, that, the only thing I think that bothers me is just general human rudeness. And I oh, think yeah. that's, you know, and demanding, demanding answers, those kinds of things. But that's not a newbie problem. That's a, that's a personality. That's a manners problem. Yeah. Right? I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, sometimes I'm, I'm surprised at the questions because <laughs> usually they're like in the video that you're asking. That you're about. actually, uh, yeah, yeah. You could it's go, like, go well, back up, read it. Did you read the link I let down? I posted. Yeah. I'll watch the video again and you'll again, be all right. You'll have the answer. So, so that could be frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. But man, I, I don't have an issue with it. I've answered. And, you know, everybody asks questions in a different way, too, right? So you get. Well, lots of times people don't necessarily want to know the just the answer. They want reassurance. Mm, yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm always happy to offer that because. Yeah. It's just really, it's really intimidating sometimes when you're learning something new. Yeah, and I think that 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 goes down to what people's confidence levels are. Like, there's a lot of insecurity out there. A lot of people are yes. afraid to make a mistake. There's a lot. They're afraid to ruin supplies. They're afraid to look bad. They're afraid to look dumb, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I've, I'm, I have ADHD. I jump all over the place. I like. I make mistakes all the time. All it seems like the, time, the only yeah. way I can actually learn something is to make the mistake. Well, so, it's really cracks me up when somebody will say, oh, I can't believe you make mistakes. Well, of course I make mistakes. <laughs> Every day's a mistake. <laughs> Come on. 
why do you think we're so good at repairing stuff? <laughs> Like, why do you think I know about uh, how to, you know, use acetone something. is because I've absolutely blown it on something else. Yeah, yeah. no, it's absolutely, it comes all the, those skills and they're just skills that you develop over time. I, it, I think people at the thing that can get a little frustrating is people ask before they, they try to figure it out on their own. Yeah. And I think there's so much information now, if you just Googled it. Most likely Ginger or I are going to come up. Right. And actually when our new website comes up, I'll come up way more often than right now. Oh, I'm no, why did you get busy? No, no, I don't mean more than you. I just mean more than yeah, what more than it's happening right it. now. Um, they, yeah, I just think that people could try a little harder to, yeah. to try to figure it out first before asking. Because it's like they watch a video and they jump, jump, jump. They use the skip button. And then they go, yep, don't know the answer, going to ask. Like, well... Mm -hmm you could just slow down and try it again and, and figure it out a little bit on your own and then ask because then or try the thing because you can't ask the right questions unless you've actually tried doing it mm -hmm. so but anyways <laughs> okay very true why does fully baked liquid clay etch past plastic storage jars and why is there leftover plasticizer left on my silicon molds? Say this again. Why does fully why does fully baked liquid clay etch plastic storage jars? And why is there leftover plasticizer left on my silicon molds? We had a little head to head scratch over this one. I think the thing wasn't properly baked, is what I think. I I'm think gonna disagree. Oh, really? Um Okay, I had some silicone lace molds and I baked glassomer in it, which was the liquid clay that Lucy Clay came out with. And it is really high, it's very dilute. It's very runny liquid clay. And it's mostly plasticizer with not very much um, PVC in it. And what I found is that it, first off, it, the mold absorbed plasticizer out of it. So the mold got kind of bubbly, not, not bubbly, but warpy because it got, it swelled. The mold swelled, the lace mold swelled a little bit and the oil came through it. So the mold itself then started to ooze oil after I baked it. So that has happened. Um, have you, I've you never noticed, had. Hmm? Did you notice that the Lucy Clay stuff remelts when you get it hot again? No, I did not notice that. I, th I think it's probably bonding with that with that silicone mat is probably what's happening. Hmm, interesting. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I don't know. Points, I don't know. Um, so sometimes, so yes, sometimes you have to remember that plasticizer. There's lots and lots and lots of plasticizers. All a plasticizer is is a molecule that fits in between the PVC um, particles to allow it to be flexible. So um, vinyl that is not plasticized is rigid, like a PVC pipe. Um, if you want, if you add plasticizer, it gets goopier, you know, goopier and goopier until you get a fishing worm, which is lots of plasticizer in it. So. <clears throat> um, so that plasticizer, there's lots of different plasticizers. Some of them are very high molecular weight, which means it's a large particle of plasticizer and it stays in the clay. And some plasticizer is very low molecular weight, which means it's little and it diffuses through. So it is possible, depending on the plasticizer, to have it diffuse out of baked materials, which is actually why some sealers get sticky on polymer clay because the plasticizer in the baked polymer is migrating into the vinyl that's in the paint or varnish. And that's why some varnishes, it just depends on a chemical interaction. Um, 
So yeah, those plasticizer particle uh, molecules absolutely could be leaching into the, the mold. Uh, that does make sense. I've had it happen. Um, as far as baked liquid clay, etching. Um, I, I don't think she said it was liquid clay. I think she said just baked, fully baked clay in a plastic container. So fully baked liquid clay. Oh, liquid clay. Oh. Yeah, etching plastic storage jars. Well, um, I'm not sure why. Don't you think it's not properly? Maybe there's just more oil still in the, like, available? No, I think it just migrates out. I think if it's in styrene, I think it would do it. I think if you, but I don't know how you would have fully cured liquid clay in a storage bottle. Unless she cured it No, I think it she's just it. talking about, like, putting it in a container to, like, like I have, a, like, yeah, to store it. Yeah, it'll, it, it, I, I don't see what, I don't know. I mean, it's possible. There's so many variables there. It depends yeah. on the plastic, depends on the clay, depends on the, the, the brand, depends on what's, how long it's in there. I, the I don't loose, think it's loose clay Glossomer is a weird product though. It was a weird product. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can, uh, yeah, I can show you what, it, oh, I think, oh, damn, it's not there. I you painted it on a, else. Yeah, um, I painted it. No, I know where the the glass are right here. Oh, see. Yeah, no, I have my wall of supplies. Yes, um, yes. But the weird thing about it, I, I painted it on a on a glass water bottle, mm -hmm. and it cured, and it was rubbery and stretchy. Mm, it's then, very stretchy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if you, it, it broke quite easily. Like it would tear really easily. Like mm -hmm. you could, it That's didn't work as covering on my water bottle at all. Like mm -hmm. I did a liquid clay one. I I can see that one, <laughs> but I don't know where the other one is. Anyways, the but is if you got the the baked glassomer, if you got it hot again, it would remelt. So <laughs> it was really cool. You could cover like a bead with it and then just hit it with your heat gun and, and repair any damage or anything to it. But mm -hmm. I try to do like a, a raised add a layer, add a layer kind of situation. Mm -hmm get you know like one of those full um lamp work kind of things right, right, it's very right. clear but it just would melt the other side like it would melt okay. underneath so yeah every time you got it hot you could melt it and just put it um, probably because it has so much plasticizer in it it's actually dissolving the baked clay that it's being so it's just redissolving itself yeah it just seems like it's not actually cured it's just rubbery like it's just it's the mm -hmm. weirdest it's the weirdest mm -hmm. stuff and um, I was talking to Lucy last week or whatever, and she said that they don't, they're not selling it anymore. Yeah, I knew they weren't selling it. Yeah, which is probably good because I don't think it was ready for prime time. No, but it was the coolest thing. Like I always wanted to figure out, like to use it as a rubbery thing, like to yeah, yeah, like, like maybe yeah, yeah. as like a um, like if you had a pendant with removable things that you could stick on, Ooh, like clings. Yeah. yeah, like clings on on your pendant, like uh, mm -hmm. you know three D things, and put that as the rubber in between it, <laughs> the rubbery stick tacky surface. I don't know. I never figured it out. So I, I guess I guess semi stumped. Yeah. Yeah, stumped a bit. <laughs> Here's one. How do you thicken clay? Sorry. How do you thicken liquid clay without adding solid clay in a time efficient way? Thanks, Phyllis. <laughs> well, Thanks you, can that one, <laughs> you can add powders to it and it gets a lot thicker. Yeah. So I would yeah. think. Yeah. yeah. I've added the like chalk pastels and stuff to it. Of course, you would change like the the clearness of it and you would also change like the like the kind of texture of it the, like but you can add powders i i'm assuming that you've tried to like do it the slow way where you just leave the lid off but um yeah i think the only way you could do it is adding something like like a powder now i wonder if there's sort of something clear like um that's exactly where i was going yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so what do you got? Do you know of a clear powder? Oh gosh. I'm a totally, powder? Yes, there are some. Um well like very you know sweet, put I don't on. know. It it's it gets complicated. It's I don't know. It would have to be relatively inert though, because you want wouldn't want to well you would up. want some of the you would want some of this some of the binders that are used in polymer clay. So some sorts of um um 
I don't know if it would work, but fumed silica might work. Fumed silica might work. Um, I'm not sure killer embossing powder would work. I'm seeing that in the comments. Um, um, embossing I think powder it, dry, um, melts when it gets hot. So yeah, it, it wouldn't be the right kind of thing. Yeah, but I think um, fumed silica might work. That's I've one. Never, yeah. uh, there's also, oh, I'd have to look it up. I cannot remember. There's another um, aluminum hydroxide is another one that might work. Oh, I have that sitting around by the buckets. <laughs> yeah, I actually do, but that's, I have it by the way. <laughs> it's a medicine for my cat. Okay, oh, I have some okay. of it. All right. But I think that, that might work, but it's also white. So I, I don't know. Um, but another strategy that I would try is, it's kind of like what Cindy was saying about letting it um, evaporate. Um, but you can do it in another way. You could possibly leach it um, instead of being on paper, um, find something that's semi-absorbent for to get some of that out without, I don't know, I don't know, but I mean, that's an avenue to go to. I know that when you put liquid clay, well, you put any clay onto some plastics, the plastic does absorb some of the plasticizer. So that might actually be a strategy. And maybe since we were just talking about silicone molds and the plasticizer going into the silicone molds, I wonder if one of those silicone sheets like might not be a bad idea. Yeah, it's like what Cindy has, something like it's that. It's like a hot glue mat that yeah, you yeah. buy at the dollar store. I wonder, now it might ruin the mat, yeah. but I wonder if that might if you spread it out on that of course they you know let it sit there for an hour or something and then scoop it back up but that's well, like put it on a coffee filter or something like that where you, you would get know, that would just like absorb it out and then you get powder but then you'd also it depends on what you it depends on your liquid clay too because some of your liquid clays are like sculpey clear that have powder in them and some of your liquid clays are like tls that doesn't really separate out into powder like that so I would anyway. probably like if it was me, I would put a um one of the chalk pastels or a mica powder in there yeah. depending like to thicken it up because when I made these um these blackberries, they I did like it was a paste basically that I got it to. There's a point where you go too far. Shelley, but yeah, depending Shelley on what just Shelly just suggested um leaching it on baked clay. Put it, make a sheet of baked clay, put the liquid clay on it. So instead of using a silicone mat, like I said, use a baked clay and then scrape it back off, which, yeah, that might work. It's worth a try. You know, this falls I, under the category of try it. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I know, know that you can put liquid clay onto like a sheet of raw clay and it will absorb all the way in and become. Right. That's what made me it. think about it. That's what made me think of it. Um, you'd have to be super careful to not get any lint in it, though. Lint or scum or dust or something, because that, you know, you're, you're just increasing the surface area there. So that could be an issue as well. You could also ask the, what Donna Cato did to make her um, poly paste. <laughs> well, if you're making it thicker to begin with, that's fine, but. Yeah, I don't know. I don't that's know. What, that's that where I would go. Right? Yeah, powders or, powders, yeah. or leaching it in some way. Leaching sounds like a fun one to try. Semi stumped again. What if, it, what if you put it on something non absorbent, but like a screen, like a silk screen type screen? Like and let it sort of leak out the bottom, like. like You'd have to have a pretty bottom. fine screen, though, because the particle size is pretty tiny on that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're semi stumped on that one, but. <laughs> So I you know where we would we know where we would start. Yeah, we, I would start with the powders as well, and I would start with leaching. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and then yeah. okay, that's half an answer. Uh, okay, the heat set pins I used to have I used have turned sticky after multiple curings. It's another multiple curings question. How do you prevent this, and why is it happening? What's happening to them? They're doing what? And the heat set pins are turning sticky after multiple curings. Ooh, I've never had that. I don't know. I haven't. Um, I'm assuming we're talking Genesis. I, um, I think so. 
um, I haven't done enough with it to have that experience. So I don't know. Yeah. Do you think that maybe the clay isn't proper? Like uh, the people that use Genesis usually are doing it on dolls and stuff like that. Do you think that they're under curing? Cause I saw a really famous uh, doll artist the other day, basically under cure recommend yeah, yeah. under curing the clay. And I'm wondering if there's uncured clay on the inside of that head, that is just sort of mm, reaching out, making that's stuff sticky. Um, you know, one of the things I've found is that when I get a question about something that doesn't make sense to me, it's often because something else has been going on and that person didn't think it was significant. Yeah. So yeah. did you mix something into the Genesis or um, I don't know, what, what is it painted on? That kind of thing. Um, did you apply something over it? In other words, it might not just be the multiple bakings that cause stickiness. So I don't know. Um, I know someone who does work a lot with Genesis and, um, and I'm, I'm looking at her face and she's gonna laugh, <laughs> Phyllis. <laughs> have you had um, have you had that happen? I know you work a lot with Genesis. Have you had it turn sticky with multiple bakings? I usually don't bake it more than once. Okay, it's a final step. Okay, I don't know. So stumped. There you go. Totally stumped. Yeah, yeah. I haven't worked with Genesis at all. It's yeah. I haven't tried it. It sounds super cool. Stumped. I, I did multiple cures on my art doll with the Genesis and I didn't have any issues with it. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think sometimes they're, they're a lot of these things that these bigger pieces are just under cured, like mm -hmm. they're just not cured all the way through. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I've used Genesis on several dolls and multiple bakings and usually takes many bakings to really get a, a good um, blush and, and finish on a face or hands even um, multiple bakings because you you put it on in layers so I've, I've never had it go sticky on me okay so we don't know we'll need more information well, one, one other thing that happens a lot that people don't think about is humidity and like mm. humidity is a big problem it it is and you know you would think in a place like here that rains all the time you think the humidity is pretty high but the air is always relatively cool so yeah. all, of our, all of our humidity falls out and lands on the ground you know so this i don't is, deal with this that. is something i well i do um the the climate here is extremely humid and um we we have a lot of humidity here that that thick kind of humidity that when you pick up a magazine it's limp mm. Yeah, we have that here. And um, so, yeah, I think that can cause some problems. And it, then maybe that is the problem that there is moisture into it. Yeah, because I was talking to Arnold uh, Goldman from Cosplay, and he said that, you know, a lot of the biggest issues are with um, clay in their raw state is, mm -hmm. is humidity issues. So I could, I'm going to agree with that. This is certainly a problem in some. Uh, that's why Mod Podge is a definite no-no and dimensional yeah. glazes. It's, yeah, it's humidity. And you know, yeah, and I had done some tests with triple thick and I had zero problems with right. it. So I assumed and it was fine. Mess. And then like I got all the this basic hate mail. Hate mail. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's go, funny because I say not to use it and I get hate mail from people that are like, it works perfectly. It works you just don't know what like you're doing. Think, like, yeah. So yeah. So now I say don't make things i i'll you know i don't make it as cut as dry anymore i'll say okay this product worked in my area for right. this yeah, yeah, yeah. on this clay um yeah so but humidity could be a part yeah. of it okay okay that's the last question anyway okay now, what's your favorite image transfer method for inkjet and laser copies and how do you prevent it from smearing I like liquid clay to as a as a transfer medium. It works beautifully. Um, I don't like it, uh, and I've done that. Uh, I've done that um, whole you know inkjet thing where you print it on the the um, parchment paper and then you 
you, you carefully take it and transfer it. It's basically just little dots. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Um, it's on it's on our old blog. Um, Valerie Aharoni or whatever her name was. Valerie Aharoni, yeah. Yeah, she she used yeah. to do this cool thing where you'd take you'd tape a piece of parchment paper to a regular piece of paper so you could run it through your inkjet printer, and then it the ink would sort of sort of stick to the parchment because it's parchment and it's not plastic. So, it, but it beat up enough. Like it didn't really soak into the paper. So then you could transfer that over and it works fairly well. It's usually a little faded and that kind of thing. Probably your best bet with inkjet is to get that fancy paper that, you know, T dissolved, T transfer yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But it is doable. It gives a sort of a vintage vibe because it's sort of dumbed down the colors and all that kind of stuff. But it's, as far as not smearing, you, that's just going to have to take practice because you got ink that isn't really sitting on the surf like it's it's not absorbed into the surface and you're you're going to smear it if you're going to be rough with it right so right. It, it, unless it's it, it's toner transfer and then the toner bonds to the clay right so mm -hmm. anything with inkjet and it's like oil and water right you, they're not going to blend i mean they're going to sit on top of each other mm -hmm. So it's always going to smear. It's just sitting there, right? Until it gets mm -hmm. baked and cured. But then with the image, like I like toner transfer. Liquid clay is the easiest, but you can also do it. And then, uh, you know, bake it right on there with the paper and everything and then wash the paper off it. You can scrub it even with the toothbrush and it works mm -hmm. really well. And But I, I don't like doing image transfers anymore. They're not fun to me. <laughs> I um, like doing yeah. other stuff. <laughs> I will agree. Uh, I've never done, I've never had a successful inkjet transfer, personally. Uh, you need to have some sort of, if you just try to put the, the transfer directly onto the clay, um, inkjet ink is water-based and does not stain clay. So like Sandy said, it just sits there and there's nothing to stick it together. It's like putting watercolor on your clay. It might, it might sort of dry on there, but it won't actually. It does. It, it will stick if you do that. That um, like with the parchment stuff. But yeah, mm. you have to bake it right on, and it, it's all faded and all that. Right, kind of stuff. right. So, so that's the that's the thing with the the ink jet. Now, as far as the toner's transfer is concerned, I've actually never had a problem. I mean, maybe it's just my printer, but I've never had a problem just slapping it on there, coming back in an hour and rubbing the paper off, or yeah. even yeah. if you wait long enough, take the paper off. But what I know has happened because it came up in the community, um, Phyllis had some problems with ink, I'm sorry, toner transfer, then continuing to soften on the bit on the raw clay, which is the same thing as raw paint, same concept as raw paint softening on FEMO. So in that case, the solution is to get on with it and hurry up and bake it. Or, but what Phyllis found is if she switched to a different printer and used different toner, it worked better. So um, I think you have to experiment with um, your printer to, to get the right one. And if, and you so, also yeah. should be really careful when you're, you don't use hot water when, when you're rinsing ah. off the paper, it'll smear. Also just be super gentle. Like just, if you're doing the toner, tra toner transfers work really well on the mm -hmm. clay, um, on Primo anyways, I, I, used, I used to do it quite a bit. Um, you just use cold water so that it's, it's keeping everything as as stiff as possible. You're not bringing extra oils and stuff to the surface. You'd be super gentle when you're rubbing it off. And also I often won't go to the final spot of it. I'll, I'll leave a little bit of a haze of paper on there and then just really good scrub it after it's baked. Right. But yeah. Right. I, I could see an issue if you left it sitting around for a day or two, it could start kind of migrating a bit and smearing and, and bleeding and, and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But I generally have baked it once I've got the paper off, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interested in using it right away, but. And Phyllis just said that Kato, um, what did she say, Kato and Primo uh, smear less than other brands. I'm going to agree with that. Fimo and Cernet would, I'm positive, would smear more. 
Oh um, yeah, as soon as you get the water they're... on there. Yeah. Well, it's not just the water. It's it's also the fact that the plasticizer is soaking into the. Um, we already know that the plasticizer soaks into the toner, right? Because that's what causes the transfer. And it'll keep soaking into it and make it just super soft so that it can smear. So Cato and Primo are less than Cernet and um, female. Another thing to mention, Shelly popped up in the chat and mentioned she's been working with dye sublimation. Ink Ooh, yeah, yeah, it. Michael. yeah, there's a whole world of experimentation on that. And if that's something that interests you, if you know anything about dye sublimation, um, there's do a search for it in the community. There's a huge thread about it in there. Um, that Shelly's been working on it. And um, I think it has a lot of possibility. I think it's, um, I think in some ways, image transfers are more versatile, but it's always good to have another Option. Well, you can get those <laughs> sublimation pens and stuff now for crickets yeah. and all that kind of stuff. God, I need a cricket. And I did a little bit with that with the the they and I posted about it in that thread. I did a little bit with it and it's unpredictable. I'm still not 100 percent sure how well it could be used, but it's absolutely a tool to put in the toolkit. Oh yeah. And it's one to start, you know, playing with. See, yeah, see what works and what doesn't work and yeah, because you can, when you're starting to fine cut out, you know, all kinds of stuff, there's the sublimation papers, there's the inks, they have them at Michael's now too. So even yeah. the average Joe can get them and, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's worth looking into. Pretty cool. So, all right, Jennifer, did you have another one? You that is that. it. That's that all the questions it. we have. Mm. Well done. Well done. So what's our say? For everybody, there were more questions. Jennifer, what that. about the plaquing questions? So what was what was the, you said, Jen? The plaquing questions, they didn't come up. There was there were two oh. questions. One. Uh, While she's looking for that, Cindy Holt was using uh, hand sanitizer in yeah. transfers. Sometimes, it, I think it depends on your printer as to whether or not it causes it to transfer or not, what to release from the paper. And, and I think I it's, think it's only because of the rubbing alcohol there, or like mm -hmm. the alcohol in it that's sure. doing it. I've tried that and I haven't had that great a success with it. I found it just worked better just letting it sit and rub it on. Yeah, it. Um, but again, it, I, I think it brand. depends on, I think it depends on brands. I think that's why we're getting all this variability. Yeah. Because it's, um, the reason why Cindy likes the hand sanitizer is because it stays in one place and it stays wet longer. Because if you try with rubbing alcohol on it, and I've even seen on some old tutorials that you use vodka and stuff like that, um, but you could use rubbing alcohol, but it evaporates right away. But hand sanitizer, because it's goopy, just stays there for right, with that gel know, five minutes or something. Interesting. So, yeah. I, I found the questions um, yeah, it's, here. Do you I've have got, it? I've, Go ahead. Okay. It's okay. I can say I have missed a question. It was it was the tenth one. It's uh, about plaquing. Oh, okay. Is there a proven way to prevent plaquing, especially in translucent clay? And is there a way to create them reliably, reliably to create the effect? I know how to create them. You create them um, because I'm good at creating them. Um, to create them, make sure that you bake as close to your element as possible. That'll do it. Um, if you um, if you heat it up rapidly on the surface rapidly, it'll it'll go. Um, it'll 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 you get a lot more plaques. Um, as far as present preventing them is concerned, this kind of goes what we were talking about earlier. Um, you need to make sure that you're heating as slowly as possible. So yeah. starting from a cool oven. Yeah. Or we're making between tiles if you're doing flat stuff. That'll that'll help. It won't prevent it, but it'll help. Yeah, I think that the the plaques are little like fissures or little splits mm -hmm. where it's not sticking. And I think the reason why it doesn't stick to itself sometimes is there's air or moisture or some sort of foreign material like or dirt, grease, something. There's something there. And it's usually what, like, I think that I, I've noticed you can, if you get the clay, especially something like FEMO that plaques really well, mm -hmm. if you get your clay really wet and work in water in there, you're going to get extra mm -hmm. plaques. Also, um, 
plaques also are, I don't find them to be between layers. I find that they are, sometimes they're like this and sometimes they're like this, they're at different angles. Yeah. They're always a little round lentil, um, but I think they're at different layers. I think that they are gases that are escaping and they're escaping and getting stuck like that. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah that, that's what I, I think too. I think they're a split, like they're just, right. They're splitting. I don't mean. I didn't mean layers. Right. But, okay. Yeah, yeah. But like they're they're causing a split in right. the in the clay. Right. And yeah. And I think it's air and and water that's doing it. Mm -hmm. I think, no, I did an experiment once where I um, I took Pardo, and I put some in a vacuum chamber with desiccant, and <laughs> another one with a vacuum chamber with moist sponges and I left them there for like two weeks and then tried them and I didn't completely get rid of placking and the moist one didn't necessarily have more placking but it had a lot more opacity the clay was not as translucent but what if you that's probably because it's not really absorbing it from the outside because mm -hmm. if it did absorb it from the outside, it probably would gas off because dry off, right? But if it was worked in, like if you spritz the clay and worked in the water, I think you get little pockets of oh, it. Oh yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Trapped like little trapped right. Right. droplets of right. water and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And I think because it it happens more, it happens more to female because female. Female will grab the water and hold it a little bit more. I don't know what it is about it. It seems to it be- It does seem to more. It, um, it, whatever, yeah. like it, the other one seems, it seems like it has less oils in it and more powders or something like that. And, and it, it just sort of will suck in the water more. And that's why it gets goopy on the outside and sticky and slimy, like um, same with Sarnet. And I think it's easier to trap water on the inside mm. of the clay then because it's absorbed it could it could it could easily be humidity yeah. um and amy just said that melanie west swore by minimal handing to avoid plaques i'm gonna agree and disagree with that i know that if you do a lot of handling or if your clay is really really crumbly and you're having a lot of trouble getting it conditioned i know that it will plaque like crazy however if you just take a slice from a brand new block of clay and bake that it'll still plaque so huh. it's they, not because they're not getting every drop um right there out of the clay so right so it's not just handling it. but i know that poor handling does make it worse there and i i noticed like if i'm doing sheets of clay through the pass machine i always give it a good stretch yeah and and it, because like you were saying before like it kind of separates a bit and it, mm -hmm. it releases the air that's in there mm -hmm. So I always give it a bit of a stretch and it'll release. And, then and I'm not a off. fan of using pasta machines when you're when you're dealing with um, placking clay. Try to minimize use of pasta machines as much as possible. Yeah, um, I try to use it. Be good. Yeah, I try to use it just for the final roll to get it. You know, I try to do it mostly in my hands and flatten it and then just do the final roll. Um, I try to not do the, you know, the roll and fold, roll and fold. Um, you can't yeah, always do yeah. that, <laughs> but that's what yeah. I try to do if I'm dealing yeah. with placking. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you're a little more careful about, like if you are a really sweaty hand person, or if you're around a lot of moisture, or you're using a bunch of stuff like to dry it, your hands up a bit. I wonder if might little, be better. Yeah. Or like I, I used to use cornstarch on my hands quite a bit. I um, wonder. Okay. That's actually an interesting concept. Um, one of the things I have noticed is that if you bury things in cornstarch, that you have a lot less placking. Now, there's two theories on that. I've always assumed that it was because it protected them against, to, you know, it slowed down the heating because it took time for the heat to, to, to go into the, into the cornstarch. So therefore, I just assumed that was why there would be less placking. But now I wonder if it's because the cornstarch is actually absorbing whatever it is that's causing the placking because i also notice that if you bake between tiles with 
um, paper on either side, mm -hmm. you have a lot less packing as well. Yes, of course, that only works if you're dealing with like like the earring pieces that are flat. It doesn't work well if you're dealing with anything three dimensional. But right, I have right, noticed right. that it does reduce that. So there's there might be something there. Yeah, and, and possibly the weight of the tiles on there will keep it from like if it's just like a little air bubble or something trying to escape and it's just it sort of just splitting, it, it might just yeah, yeah. keep it. Mm. And mm -hmm. also with the tiles you're going to have a bit of a heat sink thing happening and it's going to happen a protect little slower. it yeah and also probably with the slower bake you probably get everything um solidifying and then it doesn't really get a chance for the little tiny micro droplets of water or whatever to gas off like it, mm -hmm. it's all solid now so it really doesn't have anywhere to go <laughs> but who knows it's a, it's a it's a bit of a mystery that we've all been trying to trying to solve, and I, I think yeah. it's water and air is the big problem. Water and air, or water and um, clay components. There, I I just say vapor. Yeah, yeah. vapor. <laughs> that works. Did that answer the question? semi stopped So yeah. Well, yeah, I think agree. You, yeah, you can avoid avoid them by doing the things like keep keep the don't trap extra air in don't trap extra water in bake slower and uh protect heat. it from the heat protect it yeah yeah sounds good okay yeah all right good well thank I, you i think that bobby is that it <laughs> i missed any more questions good all right well thank you jen you are our hero <laughs> no, she's, yeah, she's, the master, she's the question master. She's the right? question, she's master. Right? question master. The question master, exactly. And thank you, Bobby, behind the scenes, being whack a mole. <laughs> and just to say that there were some more questions, but if if you've noticed that your question hasn't come up, it's because it was on one of their websites. So if your question hasn't been answered, go take a look at the Blue Bottle Tree or Cindy's website and you'll find the answers. Yeah, I'm at polymerclaytutor.com. There you go. That's what I was going to ask is how do you find Cindy? And oh, I'm all over the place. You are all over the place. All right. Yes. So what's next for Cindy? Oh, what do you mean? Well, like my, my, my world? Yeah, what's going on in your world? Tell us. Well, we're getting closer. <laughs> You don't want to hear all the words that describe how the journey of building our new website has gone, yeah. but you know, any of you that follow me already know. Um, it's going to be awesome. It will be awesome. The reason why it will be awesome is because we'll take all of the content that we had. There's 5,000 videos, by the way, and they'll all be in one spot. And we have this cool way to search that when like right now, anyone that's in our circles knows that when you try to search something it you go down little rabbit holes but right, it's right. very difficult it's everything's broken and it's difficult it's difficult to buy from us it's difficult to to you know all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff but anyways they it'll be so easy you'll type in oh i don't know gilder's paste and mm -hmm. all of the uh times that gilder paste was ever mentioned in a blog post a video uh, whatever it's going to show up and then you'll be able to also search within the video we've got it so that it will to show you exactly where gilder's paste was said in that video and it's just going to be a, a great resource for finding answers so that you don't have to ask us yet again really good. the same thing that gets asked over and over you'll really be able good. to just type it in and that'll be for members all like that that system there It'll be a massive massive service to the polymer clay community <laughs> yeah i hope so because <laughs> you know it's funny because we should have just well in some ways we thought well we could have just started again because a lot of other people have started way later than us and they're very much done their websites and we're still working away but um you know it would be a shame to lose all those five thousand like, videos yeah. you know all those times when I've well done the stuff. funny thing is a lot of the older content is still absolutely relevant because it's like you said everybody starts somewhere and there's people starting all the time so it's still good info the product is is pretty evergreen it's not you know out of the 500 videos that we have on youtube for example or is it 500 or 700 i don't know there's a lot anyways out of those i would say only about 20 or so are pretty like they're kind of not 
they, they're dated they they the product doesn't exist anymore like the pym yeah. or something like that right. you know so out of it's it's all very evergreen content so you know placking and baking and and mixing clay and and you know leaching and and softening and all that stuff that we have to learn over time when we're just beginning is the same whether you're you know started 20 years ago or start right now so the only thing that's different now is the number of products that are available and there are some variables now that we wouldn't have thought of 20 years ago because right, there right. was only two brands of clay and there were only five brands of paint or whatever now there's you know eight 80 million resins and everything else like so it and everybody's trying everything and it's right. it gets no, it's changed a lot it's changed yeah. a lot there's a lot of yes. really cool things now so fantastic and um thank you for getting stumped <laughs> We didn't get that stopped. Not really, no. I didn't. Well, you know, I was hoping there wasn't going to be a whole bunch of like chemical questions because then well, there weren't that many. The so only one that got that's good. answers, right? Yeah, it's okay. And I didn't know anything about cosplay. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Cosplay. Yeah, we're all. That's that's the beauty of all this is that there's so many of us working on these different aspects of this, and we. Yeah. I loved working with. I love working with you, Ginger. It's it's in the hey. past we would have thought we were competitors, but. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we wanted to actually talk about is that, I don't know, because we're dragging on here, but I just wanted to say that um, there's a lot of people out there that are still quite competitive and um, possessive, and it makes it really frustrating because why? Why? So I mean, even though Cindy and I are doing the same thing, it's like, does it matter? We're doing the same thing. Therefore, we can help people together. Mm -hmm. So well, the other thing you said the other day um, in our conversation is you said you like you wouldn't consider like um, music bands to be competitors. You're just because right. you can like a lot of different you can bands. Like a lot of bands. <laughs> yeah, like and so like Ginger does a lot of written stuff. I do a lot of video stuff. Mm -hmm. I've got a looser style. She's got a more scientific style. And you're gonna gel with a different person. Right, right. And we have stuff that we can learn from each other. Right. I, I really we'll overlap you know. all the time. So we want, can, we want more of that. Can we, it on. Go, go, sorry, can I say one thing, please? Sure. Yes. Um, Marco. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I think that uh, I, I love both of you. I mean, both Ginger and Cindy because uh, Marco mostly loves Ginger because every time I need uh, I need some infos, I'm going to look on your blog. But lazy Marco <laughs> prefers definitely Cindy because every time I don't want to read, yeah, I have to admit it. Every time I don't want to read anything, it's enough to jump on YouTube. And I mean, wow, wow. Uh, I'm sorry that mm, nowadays a lot of people actually doesn't know about Polymer Clay Tutor and yeah. all the, mm. the videos that she did. I mean, right. there are, I'm constantly finding uh, people asking in, in, in a lot of groups on Facebook things that are so obvious. I mean, just type Polymer Clay Tutor and go and check that. If you don't want to read, just check Cindy. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I am here because it, it, it's your fault. I mean, you're Cindy <laughs> and, and Ginger because I've I've grown up. I'm, I've been doing this four years only, but I mean, I, I can grow so fast because of the things that you two did. And uh, I think that that is wonderful. I wish there, there are more people like you. But See, that's there just, are. Yeah, that's thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is so Thank you, thank you both. Super sweet, thank Marco. you really thank so you. much. Thank you, Ginger, and thank you, Cindy. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I think you're right. Yeah. We're going to get back on YouTube, by the way. So get mm -hmm. ready for another 100,000 videos. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I think Marco's right. I wish there were more people doing what we're doing instead of fewer. Because I think more people, um, for one thing, more people become interested in the material. Uh -huh. And the more people that are interested in it, the more every the better it gets. Uh -huh. Well, also, then we could start answering things besides baking. Because 
just, you know, there's those really cool things that like, I want to test yeah. every single product and every single material with every single thing. Like, mm -hmm. and it, you, we spent a lot of time asking, answering the same questions, same questions because, yeah. because there isn't enough education out there. So. Bingo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's more than, I, I know that Sadie and I, we've talked about this. We both work so many hours, constantly, constantly mm -hmm. working, um, answering questions, helping, um, sharing resources. And there isn't enough time to do what we really want to do. So we wish there were more people doing it. <laughs> and sadly, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of misinformation, partly mm. because they want, they learn one part of it but they didn't really learn, learn or they're bit, yeah. or they're going to they're going to the market too fast like mm -hmm. they're you know they're trying something today i mean i even saw a video years ago um that martha stewart's team and obviously martha doesn't do it anymore but like her team did a uh um uh, like a uh, what was it a snow globe with a little snowman in it and all the advice was wrong like yeah of course, they made it look cute. They filmed it. It was mm. fine today. And in about a month, it's going to look bad. So like, it's just, and it's mm -hmm. because, you know, so we have to go around and spend a lot of time, you know, straightening people out <laughs> and clearing up the information. So. And May says that, um, that somebody should start a baking coaching business. I do have a tutorial. Yes, yeah. Because that's it's what good. that's yeah, don't forget that. We both um yeah, Cindy we has both your membership and I've got I've got my tutorials and the membership. So anyway. Yeah, between the two of us, you should be able to make some stuff that doesn't fall apart. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Okay, we should probably wrap this up because we could just sit and talk all day. And sometimes Cindy and I do, it's really sad. <laughs> So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your support. Thank you for all the fantastic, awesome, wonderful questions that got us stumped. And um, we will see you guys around. Bye, you guys. See you soon. Bye.